uh, the fun run. I saw, uh, saw a couple of people at the fun run. I'm going to ask everybody who's on the panel here to unmute themselves. I'd like to begin this uh, community conversation uh, with a little bit of introductions and uh, possibly starting with uh, Eke and then going on to Ola Toby there. So Eke, welcome. And uh, if you can just do an introduction of yourself. Yeah, thanks, David. Hi, and welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Eki Eckert Gumbel. I'm a team lead of the community team with Mordic. You may also know me from other places like the Mordicast uh, and of advertising. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Hey, Toby, welcome here. If you can just briefly say hello and uh, introduce yourself, tell us what you do also and what you do right. during the day, and uh, then we'll have Norman follow you after that. All right, so my name is Eduardo Toby, and um, I'm the lead for the marketing team. I'm also the lead for the Lagos community, multiple community Lagos. Um, what I do basically is um, I work with, um, with the com company as a digital marketing expert, or I'm building my own agency where I can be able to offer uh, marketing technology solutions to people. So today, I'm looking forward to an inspiring session to be able to talk about the Mautic project. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Norman, you look super chill there. You look really relaxed and you've got the baseball cap going on there. You want to take a moment to say hello? Uh, introduce yourself to people that don't know who you are, and uh, I'll have you followed by uh, Faber there. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so I'm Norman. I'm in charge of the product team uh, in the community, so I'm trying to, to contribute as much as we can with my team um, to code contribution, uh, bug fixes, feature developments, and stuff like that. Excellent, excellent. I appreciate you being here in a big, big way, as uh, all of us do. And um, Faber, hopefully you're there. If you want to turn on your video, yeah, you're more I'm than welcome here. to. I am here. And, I have a power outage, and so my laptop is like low, and I'm joining in from another device. So that's why the camera is turned off. But um, I'm the team education lead, and I'm happy to be here and join this interesting section. I'm also happy to meet, like, Every one of you, I'm not sure I've met like most people here before. So this is like a great opportunity to like meet you and interact with you. Excellent, excellent. I'm glad that you made it with uh, all your technical uh, issues that you have going on there. So <laughs> thanks, thanks for joining in. Um, yeah, sure. And if I can have uh, Dries uh, introduce yourself, and then also uh, after that we'll have Ruth. Maybe how about this, Dries? Maybe you can in part introduce Ruth. All right, sure. So Do you want to start with yeah. myself or? Yeah, you go yeah. with it. Please. All right. Well, I'm Dries. I'm also a member of the Modic Community Council. Um, I started the Drupal project uh, 20 years ago. Um, I'm still the project lead uh, today for Drupal. Uh, I co-founded Acquia. And I'm the chief technology officer at Acquia. So during my day, I do a lot of Zoom meetings and a lot of email. Um, work very closely with Ruth, too. Uh, but yeah, Ruth is the uh, project lead um, for Modic, uh, and um, she she works at Acquia as well, and that's why we work uh, closely together. But um, obviously, Ruth has a long history in open source. Uh, prior to Modic, she was very involved with Joomla, and obviously today she uh, is super involved with Modic. I don't know how she does all the things sh she does, like. Uh, you know, driving uh, the organization of a conference and presenting. Uh, pretty amazing what Ruth has done, uh, I think. And um, she's making a lot of great things happen for, for Modic. So we should all be proud and lucky to have her as our project lead. We all confirm. Yeah, that's welcome. Yeah. And uh, Ruth, what do you think about that? Was that, uh, is that you in a nutshell there? Or? Yeah, pretty much. If the accent didn't give it away, I'm based in the UK. So, um, but yeah, pretty much. That's a good introduction. So. All right. All right. I see you on Slack uh, in the uh, wee hours of the morning as well. I don't think uh, Drias mentioned that. I imagine that uh, you get those email responses to all of us in, uh, in, in, your, in your off time there. So thank you for all <laughs> the contributions that you make there. Uh, uh, not just Ruth, but everybody who's in the house here. Um, yeah. I'd like to. I am quite uh, strict, actually, by not working in my evenings, but <laughs> occasionally I do respond. Yeah. <laughs> I would like to once again emphasize to anybody: please drop any kind of questions for the group at large. 
here into the chat. I'll be sure to circle around and uh, and get to it. Uh, by the way, there's something that uh, already came up in the chat is, uh, um, Ruth, you're a lot more than what was just said, okay? <laughs> and I agree, I, I agree with that, by the way. Um, yeah, there's no, yeah. no question about it. So let me let me begin by asking uh, a first question here, uh, which is a big picture question. I'm, I'm curious, uh, in different people, uh, multiple people can maybe speak towards this. Uh, how has, you know, we're 75 months now since version 1.0.0, uh, how how has Maltic been doing? Um, I mean, I'm not just talking about in terms of the adoption, which is growing, but uh, also in terms of uh, community growth. So does anybody want to take that question? How is Maltic doing in terms of uh, community growth and its adoption? Eke, we'd like to speak on that one first. Oh, sure. I mean, I, mean, um, I guess Ruth has the real numbers and we, we have a, an open dashboard where everybody can look that up. Um, but but you're asking, the, or whoever did the question was asking it the right way. Um, it's not only a quantitative, but also a quali quality, quality, whatever, quality <laughs> thing. Uh, how, how did things evolve? The, the, the sheer numbers are, are really uh, exponential. We, have, we had a uh, rather flat time uh, around two or three years ago, I guess, where, where contributions slowed down, adoption slowed down, and we've seen it picking up now for, for quite a while and, and with, with increasing growth, and we think it's, it's kind of a snowball effect now. And of course, it's our job as the Mordic project and, and uh, specifically as Mordic community team to, to support that snowballing and to, to increase it further. Further. So I'm very happy with with the, the spirit that we have. There's something that you cannot have in numbers. Um, with, with with the product itself, with, with what the product team is delivering. So how is Mordic doing? A big part of that is, of course, the product. And uh, so, well, we'll hear more about that along the day. But but uh, I think that's that's great. And so the other big part is the Mordic community, basically, and and. All the things, the foundations that we have been laying are still laying, which uh, are already there to to make even more possible going forward. All right, I'm going to pick on Norman for a second. Uh, Norman, in terms of uh, the product team, do you have any thoughts about how it's doing in terms of adoption and the community growth around the product side of things? Yeah, I, actually, I had the chance that uh, uh, with Bruce, we've been there since. Oof, like for, for five years ago, six years ago in the product now. Um, at that time, Ruth was not the product lead. Um, she was a simple contributor as me. Um, and yeah, the, the, the water has been running under the bridges. Um, Motic One was the launch of a, of a, I would say, of a beta project somehow. And, uh, and since that, we have been structuring the community, structuring the product team, Structuring also the way we we handle uh, code contribution because at the very beginning we didn't have so many people to review it so uh, the quality of code has been changing a lot all the processes has been uh, reinforced uh, now everything is uh, double checked before adding to the to the to the code base to be sure we we have le less uh, issues in the future um, what else yeah we have also uh, a good code coverage uh, of tests so we. In, we integrated many ways to to improve the the sustainability of the of the project uh, and of the code and we have met several steps like uh, changing the version the major version of the framework symphony we use uh, from two to i mean at the very beginning i think it was symphony one at the very very beginning uh, but i didn't see the step from one to two but we do the we did a big change last year from two to three uh, recently, the, the step has been uh, done from three to four. Uh, next year will be Symphony 5. So we have put in place uh, several things to, to make the community robust and, the, and the, the, code, the code base robust and sustainable for the future. And, and this has been a huge work. And I agree with Dries, uh, the impact of Ruth is not, uh, is not I mean, he's, Ruth has been doing a lot for, the, for it, yeah. Excellent, excellent. Thank you for that. Anybody else want to contribute to that kind of question there? Um, how we're doing in terms of adoption and growth? I would, but I am mentioning a lot of it in my keynote. So subtle, shameless plug, come and listen to the keynote. 
<laughs> Don't right. want to give away all the secrets. <laughs> I can add. Is, I can add a quick there, thing. Yes, please do. Um, first of all, I'd, I'd love. I'd love to recognize as well, sort of the evolution in maturity that I've seen across the board in terms of, um, you know, roles and responsibilities, clarity of organization, clarity of roadmap. Uh, mature, the growing maturity around testing. I mean, it's hard to find a place where Modic didn't improve, <laughs> quite honestly. So I've, I see a lot of uh, positive changes. But one thing that we've seen at Acquia is larger and larger end users uh, adopting Modic, which uh, I don't think anyone mentioned yet, but that's exciting too. You know, we're seeing not just small uh, organizations use Modic, but sort of organizations that um, are quite global and quite well known in the world. And I think that's a very encouraging trend as well. Yeah, to that end, Dries, I have a, um, a question in your direction there. Uh, recently, uh, Gartner came up with uh, what they call their magic quadrants. I don't know if you're familiar with that, where they rate uh, different projects. And uh, for the first time, uh, congratulations, uh, Campaign Factory showed up on that magic quadrant, mm -hmm. uh, which is a really big thing for us right. all in the marketing automation sector. Um, uh, congratulations on that in a big, big way. Yeah, thanks. Uh, can, can you possibly explain to people that don't know about what the Magic Quadrant is, what mm -hmm. it is, and its important, uh, importance to the community? Yeah, sure. Um, so Gartner and Forrester, they're two, you know, probably the two largest analyst organizations. The way I would explain them to people that have never heard of them, it's like when you go to a restaurant, you may use Yelp right to kind of get a sense of how well how good the restaurant is and you may not all be familiar with yelp but it's one of the restaurant rating apps or sites and uh yeah before you book or make a reservation you check on yelp you know how many stars does it have and if it has two stars you probably keep looking for another restaurant well gartner and forrester are a little bit like yelp but it, for enterprise buyers so if you are a cio or a cmo and you're about to spend a hundred thousand dollars, half a million dollars, two million dollars. Very often, you consult Gartner or Forrester, and uh, specifically if you're looking for a marketing automation platform or an email uh, campaign platform, you may you may look for the relevant magic quadrant, you know, and to to see um, how you know these different vendors compare and rank, and most likely. If you're not an expert, you follow those recommendations and you'll pick a vendor that's sort of in the top right, which tends to be the the most successful vendors, right? But even um, even if you're not in the top right, um, you can still purchase the report from them and you, you will get like a 30, 40 page report with pros and cons for each vendor specifically. And you may learn that you know, Campaign Studio is based on Modic, it's open source. And so if you really like open source and you want to go for open source, you can learn that in these reports. Um, so anyway, maybe too long-winded of an answer, but basically uh, it allows non-educated CMOs and CIOs that are about to spend a lot of money um, or make a strategic investment in a, uh, you know, marketing automation tool to you know quickly educate themselves yep i don't think that was a long-winded explanation i think it was a perfect one there thank All you right. for that right. um you know i think that now that um campaign studio has appeared onto this magic quadrant is exposing it and mount it to a much larger community a much larger group of people that may not even know that it's been you know it's been around and it's uh, matured to this to this point uh is uh this seems to be something that is really, really notable. Can you speak towards the importance of this going forward? Yeah, it's very important. So like at Acquia, um, you know, we, we track all the deals that we do and we attribute uh, them in the sales process. So we know what percentage of all closed or won deals have been influenced by a Gartner or a Forrester. And it's upwards of 20% of all of our deals as an organization that have been touched by Gartner or Forrester. So it's in the enterprise segment, it's absolutely critical, you know, and, and to, in some organizations, you honestly can buy a solution or adopt a solution unless it's in the Gartner Magic Quadrant. 
and unless it has a good ranking in the Gartner Magic Quadrant. It's a, sometimes it's a little bit like there used to be a saying back in the day for us uh, that are, I guess, old enough that you, you can get fired for buying IBM, you know? Um, and similarly, vendors that have a good ranking in, in those, you know, Magic Quadrants and reports, um, you know, these are safe bets, you know, generally speaking, for people to make when you're not an expert on the space. So it's very, very important. And, um, you know, we spend a lot of time working with the analysts to get ranked. You know, we have to show, do demos, um, fill out long questionnaires, uh, provide reference customers. <laughs> it, it's not an easy process to get in there. It doesn't happen sort of on its own. Okay, okay, you had some thoughts on that? Yeah, just real brief, uh, maybe explanations for people out there. Obviously, I think it's well known by now that um, Campaign Factory is part of the Acquia product suite, so which is based on Mordic, as, as, as said. And um, <clears throat> the criteria for the Magic Quadrant is, <clears throat> is not purely the product, it's also the support behind it in the organization and, and the long-term perspectives and all that. So it's a really, really good thing for Mordic to be in there because the product is part of that rating. But of course, rated is the campaign factory here. And for for an open source project product to get into that quadrant is next to impossible. There, there, have, been, there have been things like that, but uh, it's, it's a bit of a blessing that we have this combination of a, a commercial flavor of the same thing. Yeah, that's exactly right. And even on the on the web content management system, for example, which is where Acquia had its roots, you know, Drupal is not on the, any Magic Quadrant. It's Acquia that's on the Magic Quadrant, or WordPress is not on the Magic Quadrant, despite it running what like sixty percent of all of the websites in the yeah. world. Uh, but Automatic is, and the reason is because the open source project on its own doesn't really. Uh, pass the tests, you know, because they look at how is it delivered. You have a SaaS version, you have a pass version. So a downloadable product, as an example, just doesn't make it <laughs> um, through the through the ranking. And honestly, I kind of disagree with that uh, personally. And we've actually told Gartner and Forrester many times that their way of doing things are kind of outdated <laughs> and not uh, taking into account open source. But anyway, they have their ways of doing things and we haven't been able to convince them to put Modic on there or Drupal on there. And uh, maybe one day they will, but they have like between quotes, somewhat silly uh, rules, like you have to have at least 10 million in revenue to qualify. Well, an open source project doesn't have revenue. Therefore, they're automatically eliminated. And so it's like the only way to get on there is by, uh, you know, through an Acquia or you know another organization, mm -hmm. but it's good that we're on it, even if it's as Campaign Studio. Um, you know, mm -hmm. we, we'll still promote that it's Modic under the hood. You know, so. Okay, thank you for that. There, um, you know, Modic is matured in so many different ways. Uh, not only in terms of the product, but also in documentation in the community. And my question specifically is about the community and uh, becoming much more of a solid product. Is there anything that um, areas where as a community we can invest time to make it a more solid product? Ruth, do you have a thought on that? Yeah, so I think it def depends on what you define as a solid product because Someone who uses Mautic would define that as all the features I want to use work and they work in the way that I expect them to use as, to work as a marketer. And I can understand easily how to use them. And it has more parity with, with products in other areas. Whereas a developer might see that as high test coverage, less bug fixes, regular releases. So there's lots of different ways we can approach that. But I think Mohit's asking that question, so I'm guessing it's from the technical perspective. I would say probably number one uh, priority from that perspective is uh, automated test coverage. And the way automated tests work is that they they have a, you have a certain piece of code, like a little block of code, and there's a test that's written that tests the, what that code should do and make sure that it does what it's supposed to. 
at the moment, well, when we started tracking this, we were at about 30%. And we've increased quite significantly recently. Come to the keynote to find out more. Um, but we still don't have a very high percentage of our product that has those tests. So it means that when we add fixes and features, there's like 60% of the product maybe that we haven't actually tested with automated tests. So from my perspective, that would help us build a much more solid product. I also think we need to be clear around the whole code management and triaging and reviewing of, of pull requests as well. Um, and to do that, we need more people who are more technical who can do those reviews. Anyone else want to have a jump in and have some thoughts on that? Yeah, so I would want to say from the non-technical perspective, so the more people that knows about Mautic and use it, the more we get to see ideas coming up on what we can improve on and what we can do better with Mautic. So the more people we can get to be able to use Mautic, the more people we can be able, the more reasons we can get more feature requests, more ideas or more features. Uh, Norman, did you have any thoughts on that also? Not, not more actually. Uh, I, I, we, we, we are quite uh, on the face with uh, Ruth uh, on that. So I, I just agree on everything which has been said. I mean, but yeah. more for, for, for this one, yeah. I think one thing I would add as well is that recently we added another role to the product team, which is, was Joey. So we have Joey and Mohit, who are the assistant team leads, with a focus on what you were talking about, um, Olo and Toby, like having more people giving us feedback about the product itself, being more engaged with the users and the marketers and bringing that feedback into the product team. Because sometimes the product team can, can be seen as being like basically engineering like just about the code but actually it has to be about the people who are using it so that's been a really good step and we're still improving that um and another area i didn't mention is which we hear from customers some people here who are running really big instances is that when you get to a certain level things start to get really challenging with mortic because of the way it's engineered really um, and so that is also a big thing we need to address with having a solid product that people can use to grow and scale. Because at the moment, depending on how you use Mautic, but generally around about the five to seven million contacts, you start to experience some issues. You have to do some pretty heavy duty optimization. Um, and people are getting successful with Mautic, so they are growing. So that's a kind of thing that we're having to address. I know Acquia's had that issue. I think Norman, you've had that at Web Mechanic as well with some of your clients. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We could reach like a few millions easily, and then over it's, it starts to be complicated. And I agree with what you say, and and we we are all aware of that uh, with the with different teams. And this is still something we we build uh, every day. Uh, and better focus on this uh, marketing approach to bring it in the product team because uh, it, it's too technical to product actually. Um, and um, like for, for for example, what are the the, the, the future uh, focus for next year? I mentioned that we'll have to go to Symphony Five. At that time, we'll have also to introduce a new UI. And it's a great moment uh, to introduce. Um, uh, an interface that will be done by UX uh, experts uh, and not from developers that do some interfaces. Um, so we're uh, more and more introducing new skills uh, in several teams and especially in product team, uh, which was really built uh, and based on the engineering uh, um, skills and, and introducing this type of skills, uh, UX, uh, marketing, do some benchmark. What does the the, the different uh, competitors? It's it's super interesting to to make a richer team and to also make the product uh, more sustainable and and uh, meeting more requirement and uh, expectation from uh, several type of users. Yeah. One thing that I've seen is um, you know end users asking for integrations. Frankly, like and often uh, somewhat ex obscure integrations too. Like, oh, do you integrate with this thing? And it's like, what is that thing even? What is that? <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, I think I would. I'm sure a lot of us are building integrations for customers. I would encourage us to consider open sourcing them. You know, contributing them back to the project because 
um, having out of the box or not necessarily shipping with core, but you know, having more plugins and integrations available, I think can really help um, the community as well. So, um, you know, think about contributing custom integrations if if you haven't already. If it's something you can do, that would be awesome. Yeah, you know, that that brings me to my, my next question there, talking about integrations and imminently uh, Mautic is about to come out with a marketplace where uh, people will be able to add in uh, uh, themes and plugins. And as we probably well know, um, uh, Drupal as well as WordPress has a really, really large ecosystem surrounding these other uh, third-party editions. And now as we're about to come up with a, uh, a marketplace, does anybody want to speak towards the the future of its importance in the uh, Mautic ecosystem? Sorry, could you repeat that? I didn't quite hear what you said at the end there. The feature no of- No problem. Uh, the future of the importance oh. of the marketplace. Okay. Um, you know, because this marketplace is now going to uh, provide a, a much mm -hmm. more explicit front end and make it much more obvious that there are integrations available and, plugins available and themes available. Uh, and it seems to be important, but I'm, but I'm curious, how important is it? And, uh, where's the future of that uh, lie? Do you have a thought uh, on that, Ruth? Really? Uh, do you want to go? Uh, sorry. Yeah, I can do that. Um, I think, first of all, I agree with David that, that the fact that we have something uh, now is, 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 is incredible. I, I love it so much. It's the exact right step. Uh, to make things discoverable, for one thing, so open source sourcing things is is great. We need more of that, but to, to provide provide something for discoverability is the other thing. And wow, we're getting there. And then we had a lot of uh, talking or discussions or ideas um, towards the future already, and uh, I have a hard time making any promises here or, or raising expectations. But but um, getting or maintaining such a marketplace is is uh, is not trivial for one thing, because mm -hmm. uh, over time, it's it's getting bloated with uh, legacy stuff that's no longer maintained, or badly maintained. It's uh, security issues become a topic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there there is or or multiple things for the same same purpose, for instance, and then you come to ratings or all those questions. Um, and then there's even more ideas like, um, can I do, turn this into a commercial marketplace? Can I get a dime or two for my template? Um, are there early access programs? Does the license allow such things, etc.? So it's, it's really um, conceptually um, wide range and a lot of opportunity too because it obviously helps our users and i think the best idea there is to look at the successful products or projects open source projects how they handle their plugin ecosystem and um, take that as an orientation maybe do some things better than others and uh, also take it step by step because of course we have uh, many other things at hand where we want to improve the project and the product mm -hmm. Uh, but it's a ton of potential and it's, of course, it's a bright future. Yeah, I think it's a really exciting step. It also helps us to be able to deliver a Mautic that's kind of very streamlined in the core and allows you to then install what you need rather than installing a whole bunch of plugins that you're never going to use or that you don't want. Um, so from my perspective, that's really positive. I do feel like we, as you were saying, Eki, it's a huge project to actually manage it as an ongoing basis. So it will probably be something that we set up a working group for. Um, and at the moment, it's severely under-resourced from the development perspective. So we desperately need developers and UX help with that initiative. So uh, You brought up a working group potentially for something like that. Uh, do you mm. mind taking just a couple of moments? I don't want to take away from your keynote later. Can you just briefly <laughs> iterate what the current working groups may be there for people that may not be familiar with the different working groups that we have? I mean, there's teams, yeah. but there's also working groups that come and go. 
Maybe I can just explain um, the difference between the terms that we use. So a team, we have five teams. It's what the, the kind of pillars that the community is just, is divided into. So I always feel that I'm going to miss someone out. So we've got community, education, legal and finance, marketing and product, five teams. Um, within those teams, sometimes there are projects that are ongoing. So it's not something that is like starts here, finishes here but it's something that will be going on for several months, years, probably. That's when we would spin up a working group. Generally, they're persistent over a long period of time. But equally, they could be just a working group that forms for a specific, specific purpose and then is closed down, if that makes sense. So we've got the Morticon working group, which organizes this event. We've got the website working group, which looks after mortic.org very very small at the moment so again we would love to have people who would like to help us with that we got any other working groups I yeah we have, uh, for the marketing team we have the newsletter newsletter team. then we have the social media yeah cool and so that's like working saying, groups. They, they come and go as well right the, the they can for yeah. this group boz dem had them the inbox expo had one yes and then there's also initiatives that are going on what the six yeah. initiatives at the moment yeah so an initiative is a project that's probably going to be six to 12 months or more probably spans multiple teams so it's not just something that one team would do and there's six strategic initiatives which i'd shared back in november that we're focusing on over these 12 months we can also have community initiatives as well so if community members come up with something that they really want to do that's not a strategic initiative they can actually decide to come together and put together a proposal for what they want to do and why it would be helpful who's going to work on that they can propose it to the most relevant team that that would fit into and we would then discuss that and consider um, whether that is going to become a, a community driven initiative we don't have any of those at the moment we only have the strategic initiatives so yeah, and Eki, do you want to talk about Tiger Teams? Because that's your baby. Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, first, maybe to distinguish a little bit, working group are basically sub parts or, or um, of one of those major teams that we have, the global teams. Mm -hmm. And uh, initiatives, as Ruth just said, are a little bit outside of those main teams and focused on, on one project and one goal and uh, with a finite end. Uh, as opposed to, to Tiger teams, which are um, focusing on a small portion of, of Mautic uh, in a more holistic way, or just like initiatives do are holistic as well. Um, and they do it on an ongoing basis. So for instance, uh, the four Tiger teams that uh, are pitching today are UX, UI. Uh, so there's, there's a little team that is focusing on, on uh, everything around uh, the user interface on an ongoing basis, low-hanging fruit, uh, long-term developments, etc. Um, then we, we had already campaigns and webhook, uh, webhooks, and uh, tonight we're going to have email, and we're going to have focus items in W, uh, w <laughs> dynamic web content, DWC. Mm -hmm. So that's the four tie teams presented today. Uh, again, that's really small teams, uh, which aim to make it really easy to get started because you don't have to know much about Mautic, at least not the, the whole thing. You only have to learn the really narrow thing and be enthusiastic about it and willing to spend an hour or two per week and make Mautic better on a constant basis and, and basically in the end come up with, with a constant firework of improvements. But but uh, again, it's not only about development. It's we need development, we need developers in the teams, but we mm -hmm. also need everybody else. And we also envision that those teams will basically become like the subject matter experts in that area. So if there's, say, a feature that comes up that touches on campaigns, but also it, it affects segments and there's a new user interface, those three Tiger teams would be consulted before that feature is merged so that we make sure that the people who know stuff about those parts are actually the ones that are reviewing it about whether that fits in the long-term vision for Mautic from their perspective. So it means we don't all have to be or try to be experts 
in every area of Maltic. Yeah, and one of the great things is that, that we finally have contact points for people who have questions or ideas or whatever. Um, so if somebody has something, okay, we do have it for security, we, we have a touch point. That's important. Mm -hmm. But if I have questions or I want to pay for a feature, whatever, if I want to do something in, in the area of, you name it, reporting, uh, who can ask? I have no idea, really. And, and in the future, that's going to be really clear and hopefully mm -hmm. really productive. Excellent, excellent. Uh, I have a question for Favor, perhaps, and, and maybe some others, uh, talking about um, the internationalization of diversity for, through the internationalization of Mautic. Uh, I'm curious on what uh, what kind of uh, initiatives, what's going forward with multilingual availability, not just in terms of the Mautic product itself, but in terms of uh, the forum, documentation, things of that sort. Okay, so... Um multilingual part of the jokes. So I think all the time someone offered to translate the jokes to Japanese and stuff like that. So I really don't know much languages, so I just know English and that's like where my focus is. Uh, but people who want to translate the jokes to their local languages where we have like more multic users, I think it's very much welcomed and it's going to be like a way for people who uh, use multics that are not proficient in English to be able to understand what the documentation is all about. Well, I think for now, we shot on hands with more people who are willing to translate the docs because it docs, it's quite large and we just need people who would like contribute their time and efforts to be able to translate these docs to languages where we have like more multic users and uh, who do not speak English. So this is like something that uh, I'll probably discuss later. Uh, with um, maybe roots to find out who and um, people who would like offer their time and effort to be able to uh, work on this part. Yep. Yeah, it's Thank not you. an easy thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's not because the docs are much, and um, also the docs need to be updated. So it's not just translating the docs, it's also looking for a way to constantly update the docs to have the new mm. releases and new features. Uh, it's not just one thing to translate and keep, it's to look for someone who's going to be uh, in charge of updating the dogs regularly. Mm -hmm. Eke, you had something you wanted to add to that, please. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I do have a ton of respect for, for that for that effort, really. I know it's a crazy deal. Um, but uh, in general, it's it's a recurring theme that that Mautic is so international already, and the potential is so international yeah. that uh, it is a, a, something across the board. It, it starts from the product, obviously, where the localization of the mm -hmm. backend has been around for quite a while, and it it, it, it is uh, always room for improvement. But, but that's that's taken care of backend and frontend as well. Uh, by the way, there's a target team for that, of course. Um, and also the community, the, the local communities is, is another huge project over here mm -hmm. in the community team. Um, because we have, we, we see a lot of activity in Japan, for instance, we have, some, we have something in Germany going on. We have five local la or non-English languages at this Mordicon alone. Um, and the, the, again, there's, if we can make it, or if we can find the time and the, the, the resources to make it happen, there's so much potential for even more locally that ties into Local localized marketing, for instance, have some local language visibility for Mordic is tremendously important in many markets, and uh, the local communities can help with that. So it's uh, an across the board thing, and and um, as a, as an open source project and a community driven project, we have the um, it is in our nature to be able to do it, but it's not, not normal. Most open source projects can't do that. And if we can make that happen, mm -hmm. that's a great thing that will help, help us tremendously. Great, thank you for both of you on that. Uh, does anybody else have anything they want to contribute onto the internationalization of this? All right, I'll take that as a no there. Um, uh, <laughs> You know, we, we were hearing during this conference a lot about fund OSS and the idea that you can make uh, your contribution does not have to be the code or to documentation or to events and things like that. Your contribution can just be a financial contribution uh, direct or fund, through fund OSS. 
Um, I'm talking now about outside of the financial contributions. Uh, does anybody want to speak towards uh, what what is our most important means to inspire and to enable the maximum amount of contributions to the project? Therese, do you have a thought on that? Thinking, I mean, I pe people contribute for so many reasons, you know, some, and, um, but I think, you know, some of, some of it is because it's a way of learning. Uh, it's a way mm -hmm. of improving your own kind of resume, I guess. Um, sometimes it's because it feels right because you get a lot from Modic and you feel compelled to give back. Uh, sometimes it's pure altruism. Um, but sometimes it's also for organizations. It can also be be like, you know, what, what do I get in return? You know, like uh, most organizations are sort of coin operated for, for lack of a better term. And they will contribute more if it gives them a commercial benefit, right? If it increases their visibility, if it helps them close or win more, more deals, you know, get new customers. So uh, I think there's sort of um, normal streams of why people contribute. But then I think you can put incentives in place to make individuals and organizations contribute even more. And I think it's smart <laughs> to uh, to do that. You know, if you want to grow your project, you don't want to rely just on, you know, volunteerism or hobbyists, because that will become a challenge over time, especially as a project gets bigger and you need to you know, institutionalize a lot of things, whether it's infrastructure, conferences. I mean, you know, at some point, if if Modic is really successful, hopefully there will be 3,000 people at Modicon and, and Ruth won't be able to pull it off on her own. <laughs> <laughs> and we want to maybe hire some event organizers, right? And pay people to help put the event together or these kinds of things. So anyway, um, you know, I think in incentive programs are, are a great idea. And I know, you know, some of them are being implemented actually right now or have been implemented already. Excellent, excellent. Uh, thank you. Thank you all for being here. Does anybody in our remaining minutes, does anybody have any other thoughts they want to uh, uh, contribute to the, to the group at large, to people who are watching? I was going to add to that last comment as well. Like, I feel it's really important that we make that on ramp for contributors as smooth as possible. So that if somebody is really inspired by hearing a talk at Morticon and they decide they want to get involved, that that isn't like a series of ever increasing height hurdles they have to jump over. And that's something that we've been working on in the council and with the team leads is making sure that that's easy a lot of the time though it is one-on-one -on -one. it is a case of like someone saying right let's jump on a call and i'll talk you through but once you've done that they're, they're ready to go they're encouraged they're inspired they can do it so i feel like that is also a really important way for us to encourage contribution all right so i would like to also add to that so one one most people felt that for them to contribute it has to be in the technical part of multi um they, they don't really understand that they can also contribute if they don't even have knowledge of coding or writing programming languages so um we have the other teams like the, especially the community the marketing and the education team that are non-technical okay that are mostly non-technical teams of which we want people to contribute more especially uh i will speak for the marketing team where we need a lot of people to help with handling so many different parts we have the working group for newsletters we have the working group for social media we have the working group for websites which would mention earlier that we have a very few people involved in that so we need people that will be able to contribute in those non-technical areas that can also help us, especially when it comes to content creations, um, visual designs, and things like that when it comes to the marketing part of multi. So we want people who will be willing to also give their time and also contribute to non-technical parts of multi. Yeah, you know, that's uh, it's kind of funny you mentioned that a while, Toby. You, you know, it's the... Uh, 
you know, how do you inspire uh, people to uh, maximize the, their participation and contributions is, is to ask. So uh, thank you for asking for, for people to participate, not just in the code side of things, but also in the other side, uh, uh, community, education and marketing, as well as and other you, aspects. Even in the product team, which is supposed to be more technical, uh, we have a lack of skills in terms of non-technical person. Um, it's, it's somehow in between marketing and, and, and product, it's where the marketer can express uh, needs, uh, can compare features, can enhance the current features, but in terms of needs, uh, uh, a, good a good developer would like to have a great uh, feature definition uh, to do his work perfectly. So, so I agree with what has been said. We, we need coders, of course, we, do, and we need engineers, of course, but we need marketers and, and anyone in any type of team, actually. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you all for participating. Uh, thank you all for being members of the uh, Community Council panel as well. I hope everybody got some information out of this. I hope you guys enjoyed it as well. And uh, for everybody else, I hope you enjoy the rest of the, the conference. There's a lot more exciting sessions coming up. In this room, which is room number three, in just about 15 minutes from now, we're going to have uh, um, a presentation from some folks over at Acquia about dynamic content and utilizing that. So uh, thank you again, everybody. And uh, we'll see you online.